Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're very glad that you could join us for our virtual Legends of the Game roundtable. This would have been Hall of Fame weekend 2020 because of circumstances really beyond everybody's control. We're not able to do that this year, but uh, we do have a chance to honor the class of 2020. And in today's edition of our Legends of the Game, we will talk to one of our newest Hall of Famers, Larry Walker, and also Ferguson Jenkins, who's a, an old veteran of this class of 1991. Uh, we welcome both of you, Larry and Fergie, to the show. Larry, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you grew up in Maple Ridge, British Columbia. Uh, tell us a little bit about that community, what it was like growing up there. Well, I think like a lot of little towns across Canada, um, you know, as a kid, you grow up and, and, and you go to the ice rink. You know, that's what we did. And uh, if we weren't going to the ice rink, we we're going to a frozen pond uh, to, to find someone. And then in the, in the summertime, it would be street hockey. So uh, it was constantly hockey, hockey, hockey for me growing up. And, uh, and that was, uh, I think, the love for all of us Canadians uh, as we, our kids and get to be adults and looking forward to the hockey season coming up here. So outside of sports, not necessarily that much to do for a young kid back then? Well, I tried to go to school as best as I could. I uh, wasn't <laughs> the greatest at that, but, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I worked uh, a little bit here and there. Um, and I guess just, yeah, I, I didn't do too much as a kid growing up, hanging out with friends. Um, but back in that time, uh, uh, arcades were a, a popular thing that we would do. So it would be constantly mm -hmm. hanging at the arcade, seeing how long you can make a quarter last. You played much of your childhood as a hockey player. You were a goaltender, from what I understand. But then, as you grew a little bit older into your teenage years, you started to gravitate toward baseball. How did that come about? Why make the switch from hockey to baseball? Uh, my last season of trying out for Junior A uh, WHL team called the Regina Pats, I, I was a goaltender, and uh, I was ended up being the third-string goaltender. So they wanted to send me to a uh, Swift Current, a Junior B team. Uh, and that second year, I actually drove to Swift Current, and I don't know the reason to this day why I said, you know what, this just isn't for me. Mm. And uh, I, I hung up the pads and, and never played another hockey game after that. Uh, and uh, 1984 – was when uh, I tried out for Team Canada. Uh, I got asked to try out for Team Canada in a World Youth Championship, uh, 16 to 18 year olds uh, in a tournament in Kindersley, Saskatchewan. So I made that team and went there and uh, some people liked what they saw. And then a couple of weeks later, I, I tried out for Team BC and we played college tournament uh, teams from the US. Uh, played in that and did well in that uh, as well. And uh, a couple of teams were interested, the, the Expos being the most, uh, they offered me $1,500 U.S., which was about two grand Canadian at the time, and that was a ton of money. And uh, I decided to take a chance and sign that contract, hopped in my Pathfinder, and drove from Vancouver to Florida to, to, to take my shot at baseball. Yeah, it worked out fairly well, as we have seen. Uh, Fergie, how about you? You were born different part of the uh, country geographically. You're born in Chatham, Ontario. Tell us about that community. So Chatham was a little farming community, about 22,000 people, uh, blue collar. Uh, we had uh, Ontario Steel, was a big plant. We had Pioneer, uh, which was a seed company, along with uh, Decal. And uh, growing up as a kid, uh, like Larry, I played a lot of hockey, played basketball in high school. And uh, baseball was like a secondary third sport, almost. Uh, made it the summertime, started in May. We're done in September, uh, depending because uh, the seasonal situation, because of the weather. Uh, I could skate all all year round if you wanted. We had, we had two arenas in Chatham, uh, and uh, I was a defenseman. And mm -hmm. uh, as Larry said, hockey was the number one sport uh, in your small hometown. We had uh, an OHA team called the Chatham uh, Senior Maroons won the the cup i'm trying to think of the name of the cup that they won back in the 60s and uh to me hockey was the number one sport uh i got spoiled because my dad took me to london ontario and i seen willie o'ree play mm. he was with the boston the uh, ruins at the time player of color and i'm 15 and i said i think there might be an opportunity for me to maybe to play in the nhl 
but that didn't work out. Dean DeJura convinced me that baseball was going to probably be my best sport. So at, uh, at the age of 16, I started pitching, kind of turned my world around about uh, playing uh, a certain sport. And, and basically pitching was the, the number one item when I really got uh, good at it at 16, 17, 18, I said, this might be an opportunity for me to become a professional athlete as a ball player. Do you think in retrospect, it maybe saved your arm a little bit and that you didn't pitch when you were 10, 11, 12, your body is still developing? We hear about, you know, kids getting hurt at a young age. Do you think maybe that helped you? Uh, probably. I was a tall, skinny, lanky kid. I played first base, uh, played a little outfield, but pitching just wasn't uh, brought up. We had, a, we had about four pitchers. We had Jack Howe, Matt Kundle, Dennis Roebuck, and uh, Eddie Myers were the pitchers on our team. And uh, as I said, Eddie Robinson and I were the two first basemen. And uh, I just thought that playing baseball, not pitching, playing a regular position would give me an opportunity to play more. Uh, we have a very short season, 25, 30 games at the most. Mm. So I thought that playing first base was going to give me more of an opportunity to play as a, as a youngster. I'm curious, Fergie, how avid are Canadians about baseball? You know, you, you can kind of rank the major sports in terms of their popularity. Obviously, hockey is number one. You've got the Canadian Football League. You've got baseball. Where does, where does baseball rank on that, uh, on that hierarchy? Huh. In the top five, probably fifth. Yeah. <laughs> we mentioned the CFL, which is big. They, they had a couple of teams in Toronto, one in Montreal at the time, and, and they went had teams out west. Uh, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, they had the Ottawa, uh, I think it was the Rough Riders. Yeah. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is baseball just didn't uh, catch on, I think, until Montreal in, in, in the 60s became uh, a franchise, especially, and Larry got a chance to sign with them and play with them uh, yeah. in, uh, in Montreal, the old park. Park Jarvis. So when I look back, if it hadn't been for Gene DeJura changing my mind about becoming a pitcher, uh, I might have considered working harder at being a hockey player. Larry, you talked about signing with the Expos and, and what a thrill that was. Uh, as a youngster, who did you like better, the Expos or the Blue Jays? <laughs> Well, fortunately, I don't have to pick either one of them because I didn't watch a lot of baseball growing up. It was, okay. like I say, it was all hockey. And uh, uh, if I did c catch a baseball game, it was uh, typically the Seattle Mariners. And that's who I would tune into. Uh, hence why my favorite football team is uh, Seattle Seahawks. Uh, mm. uh, just, um, but uh, never, never really, really watched it that much growing up. Yeah. How far is Maple Ridge from Seattle? Uh, about a three-hour drive. Okay. Did you ever go to uh, the Kingdom? I did. Yeah. I was, I'd be there early. Uh, Mom and Dad would get me there early to stand out in the left field bleachers trying to catch home run balls during batting practice. It was a common thing to do. You know, get there early, hope you get a ball. It was the greatest thrill ever. Yeah. Even though you, you didn't grow up as a fan of either the Expos or the Blue Jays, to sign with one of the two home country teams, that must have been a special thrill. Yeah, you know what, at the time, I didn't have any idea uh, how important that was or what it meant to everybody. You know, like I say, just uh, uh, when I hung up hockey, I said, I'll give baseball a shot. I didn't uh, really know what I was getting into it. I don't think I clued in probably until my double A season when I realized, okay, this is a big deal. I'm Canadian. Uh, obviously, Montreal is in Canada. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of us playing the major leagues, especially on the Expo. So uh, it was a it was a, a fun experience. I, I thoroughly enjoyed suiting up in, a, in a, my home country's uniform and, and going out there. I wanted to ask both of you about your family, specifically your fathers. We'll start with Larry. Uh, did, was your father an athlete? Did he play hockey or baseball or anything else? He did. Uh, my father and all my brothers, everybody, we were heavy into sports, uh, baseball and, and hockey being, well, hockey being the big one, baseball during the summer, but it was more fast pitch softball than it was baseball. Mm. But uh, my dad did, uh, he pitched in the 50s for the Vancouver Mounties, and, uh, and then uh, his career ended early as uh, family obligations, I think, took him away from all that. 
Now, Fergie, in your case, my understanding is your father played semi-professional ball, and he was playing for an all-black team. Yes, uh, Chatham had uh, a team uh, in the 30s that won championships, OBA championships. They were called the, the Chatham Black All-Stars. In a couple of different years, they were called the Chatham Black Panthers. And they were, they barnstormed uh, with, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 uh, individuals from the Chatham area, all, all, all Canadians. Uh, we had one Indian from Wapu Island who played for the team also. But uh, my dad was an outfielder. He threw left, and he was a left-handed hitter. And then I ended up being right-handed <laughs> the whole way, except for when I shaved. I shaved left-handed for some crazy reason. <laughs> That's the only trait that I have for, for my dad's uh, basically uh, his, uh, his uh, outstanding career was he was uh, left-handed the whole way, and I shaved left-handed. Yeah. Now, did his team travel south of the border and play American Negro Leagues teams? Uh, no, they played all in Canada. Really? All in Canada. Uh, from Peterborough to Montreal to Toronto, uh, so many of those different cities they barnstormed and played. You obviously were too young, uh, or you weren't, I guess you weren't around at that time to see your father play, um, but he must have had some wonderful stories about that experience. I've uh, got a lot of clippings. Uh, they uh, came out with a, a card uh, series of the, uh, the Chatham team uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago that I still uh, I've got it in, in my collection. But uh, I was born in 42. My dad came to Chatham in 38 when he married my mother. Hmm. Uh, the last name was a Jackson, uh, Jackson Jenkins. That was a pretty prominent family in the area. My mother's family came through the Underground Railroad and my dad was from family from the Barbados. Larry, let's, um, let's go back 1984, 1985. Uh, you signed with the Expos, actually it was November of 84, so it's after the season. And then in 85, the Expos don't assign you to one of their regular affiliates. They actually send you on loan to an independent team, Utica, New York, the Utica Blue Sox. Uh, for those not aware, Utica is only 40 miles from here in Cooperstown. Now, I know that you talked to Roger Lansing of our staff back, uh, I think it was in February when you came here for your orientation tour. And you said you didn't remember that much about the season because you struggled. You, statistically, it was not a strong year for you. But I imagine you learned a lot during that first year playing at Murnane Field. Well, that's, I say, I, uh, I, I... I learned how to hit different pitches, or I, I was trying to learn how to different, hit different pitches. And, and playing ball growing up, you know, there wasn't fork balls, there wasn't sliders. Uh, they, they threw more of a thing called a spinner than a curveball. So it was uh, it was a little a little tougher for me to see see balls doing what they were doing. So um, I, I had a lot of learning to do. Hence, probably why they sent me to two co-op teams for my first two years. You know, I just I, I wasn't much of anything at anything. So uh, I had a lot of work to do. Um, they saw athletic ability, but uh, you know a lot of a lot of instructional leagues that I went to. Uh, I think I did four or five instructional leagues and one winter ball to try to try to learn the game more. Your manager that first year in Utica was Ken Brett, former major league pitcher. He was an, an outstanding hitter, uh, also a pretty good pitcher for a few teams in the 1970s. Brother of uh, Hall of Famer George Brett. How'd you like playing for Kenny? He was great. Like I say, just uh, calm, easy, relaxing guy. Um, it, it's tough for me to remember it all, but uh, like I say, I, uh, I I was so horrible, but he always stuck with me and put me in the lineup every day. And, and uh, I went out there and, and I performed and hit 218 for him. So he had to be happy with that. And he stuck with you the whole year. Yeah. Yeah. And, now, uh, he gained some fame back in the mid-'80s because he actually made one of those great Miller Lake commercials, and he mentions Utica. You've seen that, right? I remember it vaguely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, made him, he's a legend still in the Utica area. Um, have you talked to, um, to George about Ken? Ken passed away a number of years ago, sadly. He was a very good broadcaster as well. But have you talked to George about Ken? I have not. We, uh, I haven't uh, talked to George for years. Okay. Um, Fergie, let's go back to you for a moment. When you heard that Larry had been elected 
and you knew this was the second Canadian to enter the Hall of Fame. How'd you react to that? I was pretty happy. Yeah. I got a hold of uh, Scott Crawford, who was the chairman of the uh, on the board with the Canadian Hall of Fame, and he gave me a number, but uh, that number didn't work. But I was overly happy when I heard the announcement because of the fact that, you know, for years and years and years, I'm the only Canadian. And then finally, after 19 plus years, I have a, another fellow Canadian, a position player in the Hall of Fame. Now, had you and Larry met at that point? Yes. So uh, Larry got inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm not sure what year. He'll probably tell you. And I was there for the ceremony. I had the honor of putting a, uh, the sport jacket on the new inductees for that ceremony. And I've been doing it uh, probably since, uh, oh, geez, mid eight, uh, late 80s, 88, 89. And I think it's an honor for me to go to St. Mary's, Ontario, to see and be there with the new inductees and have the opportunity to listen to what they have to say about getting inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame and their career, basically. And that's what it's all about. Uh, them uh, telling the world, especially in Canada, it's a very small city, about uh, uh, their trials and their trip to finally get inducted into uh, the Canadian Hall of Fame. I'm curious to hear more about the Canadian Hall of Fame. I've, I've never been there. What's, what's the hall and museum like, like up there? It's a very small, pretty unique. Uh, it's in a very small city like Cooperstown. Uh, they've added on uh, a couple of different buildings in St. Mary's, Ontario. A cement company was the, the, the total backer and sponsor for the Canadian Hall of Fame. We've had a lot of different board members. Uh, we've got a new president. And what's nice about it is that uh, when, you get, when you get the opportunity to, to go to the small town, people turn out because of the fact that they followed the game of baseball. Uh, the game of baseball started in Canada, I think, in St. Mary's, Ontario. Interesting. Back in the, in the early 1900s. Fergie, let's go back. Uh, the year is 1991, um, when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I actually remember it quite well. I was working in, in Utica, Larry's former town. I was working in radio, and we used to cover the Hall of Fame ceremonies here in Cooperstown every year. 91 is particularly interesting because that is the year that the ceremonies were held in Cooper Park for the last time. Cooper Park being just outside the Hall of Fame library. And then the next year, 92, they moved out to the Clark Sports Center, where it's a much bigger field, much larger crowds. What do you remember about that weekend of 1991? Well, the biggest memory I have is that uh, at the Otisaga Hotel, where all the uh, Hall of Famers that have been inducted before have a chance to meet. Uh, I'm in the room with Gaylord and, and Rod Carew, and in walks Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. Mm. <laughs> Believe me, I'm like a little kid. I got to find me a baseball to get two autographs, both those individuals uh, on, on the baseball. Willie Mays is there, Hank Aaron, Ernie Banks, uh, a lot of players I played against, uh, Duke Schneider, so many individuals, Whitey Ford, Yogi. Uh, but those two individuals I followed as a youngster, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio. And to this day, I still have the baseball in my foundation uh, office. Very nice. Did you have a chance to talk to them at length? A little bit. Uh, Joe DiMaggio was kind of a, an individual that stayed in the background. He didn't want to sign the ball at the beginning. And Ted Williams right away said, yeah, I'll sign it for you. You know, you're one of the new inductees. So... He was right away, personal, came right up to me and wanted to, uh, to sign the baseball. Uh, DiMaggio, it took a little while. About an hour later, he ended up signing my baseball. But uh, to have that opportunity and to be there at the Hall of Fame, was all, I think there was like 45 returnees, players that, uh, that had been in, inducted in the Hall of Fame. I think the oldest player might have been Bobby Doerr at the time. Yeah. And, and maybe uh, Lopez that were there, but they were a lot of older Hall of Famers, Bob Feller, you know, to, to, to shake your brain and to tell yourself that all these individuals, a lot of them have passed on, which is really unfortunate uh, that uh, that situation happened, but uh, 
I was pretty happy the fact that I had that opportunity to find a baseball. And I looked around for, for about 15, 20 minutes asking people that were connected at the time. Uh, I think Mr. Howard, is it Howard was one of the president? Uh, Howard Talbot. Talbot. Yeah. And finally got a ball and to get those two individuals out of baseball. Uh, not nervous. Uh, as I said, a lot of these Hall of Famers that uh, were there, Stan Musial, I mean, I knew them and played against them. So that was the nice part about it. Yeah. Larry, uh, how about you? Your first trip to Cooperstown, was it this, this past February when you came out for the orientation? Or did you come here when you were in Utica? When was your first trip to this village? Uh, I did go there when I was with Utica. Mom and dad came into to New York to watch uh, some games and, and we took the drive there and, and spent a day there. Uh, and then I went again with uh, the Cardinals fantasy camp was in Cooperstown at Double Day. We uh, did start, they started doing that, I think, three years ago. And uh, it was the first time. I think usually Baltimore is, a, is the team that had their fantasy camp there and the, the Cardinals did their first year. So I was able to go in for that. I uh, was able to go through the muse museum and got a tour and into the, the guts of it and see everything and put the white gloves on and uh, yeah, quite an experience and then got to do it again, of course, during the orientation. Now, when you come here for the orientation, you really are able to spend a lot of time going through the exhibits. I know that you were accompanied by our, our head curator, uh, Eric Stroll. You got a chance to look at some items in the archive. Um, I know you had a lot of fun doing that, but was there one artifact or one exhibit that really stuck with you? Well, you know, picking up Babe Ruth's bat is quite a, quite a thing to do. You know, you, you don't realize how big it is and, uh, and just, you know, the history behind that and everything that that man did for the game. It's probably the most recognizable name in the game of baseball. Um, but, you know, for me, the Starting out at the very beginning, when Eric was talking about how baseball started, the very first stop we did in the room about uh, the, the, the beginning of baseball and how, how it all began and everything, it was just incredible to hear him talk. And, and like I say, my knowledge about the game and its past and everything is, is limited uh, for what I know because, like I say, growing up, I didn't really follow baseball. So this, it, was a, it was quite a knowledgeable tour that I wish I could have absorbed everything and, and remember it all because it, uh, it was a thrill. You know, what really strikes me about that, that room, that 19th century gallery, is the, the primitive gloves that they played with. I have no idea how they could make any plays with them. Yeah, the equipment is incredible. I've been there several times. The equipment is incredible. The catching mass for years of the war. And the glove was the same, almost the same size as your hand. Yeah. Larry, how about Babe Ruth's bat? Pretty heavy, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you ain't kidding. Uh, I'm, I'm not using that in my teenage years or early 20s, never mind trying to do it later in my career. It was a monster for sure. Yeah. Um, any other uh, exhibits or artifacts that, that really kind of stuck with you after that, that trip here? Well, you know what, for me, the, the fact that they actually pulled some of my stuff out for me to look mm -hmm. at still doesn't, doesn't sit with me, you know. I, um, you're pulling my stuff out of the, uh, the artifacts at the Hall of Fame. Uh, holy, holy crap! That's a um, that's a pretty. Uh, it, it still blew my mind. You know, I walked out there going, "Wow, I can't believe my stuff was on that table along with everything else that I got to see." So, uh, uh, not saying that my stuff was the biggest thrill, but the fact that it was there it is a thrill for me. Yeah. We talked a moment ago with Fergie about the fact that you guys met at the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, what were your first impressions of Ferguson Jenkins? Well, I think you can hear it right now. The guy is, uh, is down to earth and just a gentleman as can be. We had, uh, we had dinners together back at the hotel. And, and you know what? He's, uh, he's a living idol. You know, he's, he's uh, known across Canada and the U.S. And he's in the Hall of Fame, the only Canadian in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, somebody that everybody looks up to. And he's uh, been nothing but genuine and sweet and nice to me. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, Quite an honor to meet him and, and hang with him for those few days. Well, Fergie's become a regular here in uh, Cooperstown, and we often see his, uh, his van for his foundation. Uh, that's always the signal that, that Ferguson uh, is in town. Uh, Fergie, I want to go back to 1991 for a moment um, and the speech that you delivered. Do you have any advice for Larry about uh, how to handle the speech, what to talk about, who to thank? What would you say to Larry about that? 
You want you want to do it for me, Fergie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. As long as you write it, I'll read it. <laughs> you know, you know what was nice. Uh, I tried to. The number one thing is to thank the organization. Uh, what basically Jane Clark and, and and the Cooperstown organization for getting inducted, and then you got to thank the, the Philly organization for signing me, and then uh, I got traded to the Cubs. I thank the Cubs, Boston, and also Texas teams I played for. Uh, the number one I think that uh, really chokes you up is you have to thank your parents for their guidance. Uh, talking about my mom who passed away young, my dad who played uh, and uh, had an opportunity to be there at Cooperstown with me at the time, and to thank teammates I played with. I room with Ernie Banks the last three years he played, uh, 67 through 69. Really good friend, Billy Williams, Ron Santo, so many guys. Glenn Beckford, he was my best man at my wedding. You know, uh, what's nice about it is I had an opportunity to play with some of the, and against some of the greatest players, I think, to put a uniform on and, and play in the 60s and 70s. I know in talking to a lot of the Hall of Famers, uh, I remember years ago I talked to Reggie Jackson, who was so overwhelmed by what was going on for him during his induction, he almost thought about leaving town on Saturday. He said he had to be talked into staying for the Sunday ceremony. How was it for you? Was it, was it overwhelming? Was it a whirlwind? Or were you able to enjoy it as you went along? Uh, yes, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I went in with Rod Carew and Gaylord Berry, who I played uh, against, and I was a teammate of Gaylord. Uh, what was nice is that uh, the, the comfortable part of coming there to the Hall thing, because we didn't have uh, uh, preliminary visits. I uh, had a press conference in New York. Uh, you had an opportunity to declare what team you wanted to the insignia on your hat. And Rodney with the with the Minnesota, Gaylord with San Francisco, and, and myself with the Cubs. And that was a very easy, easy press conference. Uh, Jack Lang is the individual that phoned you back then. Yeah. And uh, I knew that uh, I knew that the Hall of Fame was going to be in July. Uh, I was basically getting everything together. I had my speech done probably a week before I went to the Hall of Fame. And what's nice, as I said, I wanted to thank certain individuals. Andy Semenik was my first manager, uh, class D ball. Double uh, A and triple A was uh, Frank Lucchese. Mm. Uh, Major League Manager, Gene Mock. Uh, two of my managers that gave me more of a boundary to play, Leo DeRocha for seven years, and Billy Martin for two in Texas. And uh, I had Don Zimmer and Billy Hunter, Pat Perales. You know, I tried to thank a, a lot of individuals that gave me that opportunity to pitch. And that's the reason why I had so many complete volumes. They trusted me uh, in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning to go out there to complete a volume. And when I look back, without that, their confidence in me and me going out there continuously, until the game was over. There's been a lot of times I pitched 10, 12 innings. But uh, what was nice is they let me play, and I enjoyed that that part of what the game was all about, pitching. You probably deserve a medal, Fergie, because you survived both Leo DeRocher <laughs> and Billy Martin. You're right. Uh, Leo was tough. Uh, very short with, 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 with reporters and with players. Billy Martin was a little different. Uh, if you had a, a problem, he had an open door policy. You can go and talk to him. Uh, very seldom I went in, but uh, he, he was a, uh, an individual that listened. Leo didn't listen a lot. Leo was very short with players and with, with, with reporters. Larry, how about you? Um, I, I like to ask Hall of Famers if, if there were one or two managers that weren't necessarily their, their favorite or their, their friend, but the guy that they learned the most from. Was there someone either in the minor leagues or the major leagues in terms of a manager or a coach that you really felt helped advance your career? Um, you know, for me, like I say, I had, had many managers, uh, some pretty famous ones, one in the Hall of Fame and Tony La Russa. But, you know, I think I always go back to my first years in Colorado with Don Baylor. And uh, mm -hmm. Ruve was um, a he might not have been the best manager, you know, he made a couple of mistakes, but, but a manager that you could talk to, 
the players looked up to. And, and I think that's big when you're taking the field that you got a lot of respect and, and love for your manager. And, and Groove had that for me. And, uh, you know, when he passed, it was a horrible day uh, because of where he stood in, in my mind as uh, not just a manager, but just as a human being. One of the great leaders, certainly in baseball history. Larry, I'm curious about uh, your speech. Fergie mentioned it a moment ago that he didn't complete his speech until about a week before the induction in 1991. I was curious, had you started to write your speech before you learned about the cancellation of the ceremony? Uh, you know what, I did. Um, while I was down here in Mexico, I pulled up the computer and I, I gave it a try. And I wrote, uh, wrote a couple pages of stuff and every time I, I go over and I reread it, I get more disappointed about <laughs> how it sounds because it's, uh, it's a daunting task and I'm one that I don't look forward to at all. So that's why I say if I can write this thing and uh, I'll give Fergie, Fergie 20 bucks Canadian and he'll go up there and read it for me, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've still got you've still got a full year to work on it, so uh, perhaps something yeah. will come to you uh, in these twelve months. Um, looking ahead toward next year, and, and I've been asking all of the new Hall of Famers this question: Is there one particular Hall of Famer that maybe you don't know, maybe you've never met, that you would really like to meet at the induction in twenty twenty one? Is that on me? Sorry. Yes, that would be yeah. for you, Larry. Yeah. Um, gosh, you know, um, you know, there, there's a lot of guys and I think, you know, a big comparison that I've had in my career was always with George Brett. So, um, you know, George and I spoke once many years ago, but it'd be neat to sit down and, and talk hitting with him. Uh, I always admired his swing and what he was able to do with that and his game, uh, his intensity in every game was uh, incredible. So I, I guess if one guy jumped out at me, it would be him. Well, that induction is coming up about a year from now. It'll be July 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th. Uh, here in Cooperstown, the actual induction ceremony will be the afternoon of Sunday, uh, July the 25th. Uh, we look forward to Larry Walker joining the other members of the class of 2020. Uh, that, of course, would include uh, Derek uh, Jeter, uh, Ted Simmons, and uh, the late Marvin Miller, the head of the Players Association. Larry, we want to congratulate you on your election and your upcoming induction. And we also want to thank uh, Fergie for being with us. Fergie, before I let you go, though, I do want to ask you, uh, we want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your foundation, what you do with that, and how people can contribute to it. Well, the foundation we uh, put together in 94, uh, uh, with one golf outing with uh, celebrity athletes from different uh, fields, from hockey, basketball, baseball, football. Uh, the CFL, especially being Canada, two CFL players, uh, the NBA, uh, the NHL, and, and Major League Baseball. I think we also had a wrestler there, too. We had like 35 uh, celebrities, and we put on a golf outing at uh, Rockway Glen uh, Golf Course, raised about $90,000, gave uh, probably two-thirds of it to the Red Cross. Mm. We had like two major sponsors, uh, the Red Cross and uh, Special Olympics. Uh, the second year we had it, we added uh, cancer research. My mother died of cancer in the Canadian Hall of Fame uh, uh, because of the fact that I went in and I, I supported the CNIB, which is uh, the Canadian Institute for the Blind. My mother was blind. She lost her eyesight. To glaucoma. Uh, the nice thing about it is that we have fellow athletes that contribute their time. From Gaylord Perry, Raleigh Fingers, George Foster, to name a few, Louis Tian. We've invited a lot of different athletes, Pete LeCock, Bobby Denier, now to come uh, basically to spring training, donate their time, and to sign uh, for the foundation. We pay them per diem, uh, we pay for the hotel, the flight in, uh, and they stay about five, six weeks sometimes. Uh, the total time of spring training is on, and to raise money for different uh, charities, from Boys and Girls Clubs, Special Olympics, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, uh, the charities that are, that are really influenced uh, to certain people. Uh, and we try to contribute to five, maybe $10,000 over the, the course of spring training, make that money and donate it to the, the charities when spring training is over. 
We've been and doing Fergie, the website for people who would like to look. What's that? The website for the foundation. It's uh, Fergie Jenkins at iCloud, or it's Fergie Jenkins uh, .ca Foundation in Canada. FergieJenkins.ca. Well, it's a great cause. Uh, we certainly want to do what we can to help it as well. We do appreciate it, Fergie. And again, congratulations to Larry Walker, Hall of Fame class of 2020. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations Thank again. You. Thank you. Thank well you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. You've All been right. listening to our virtual Legends of the Game roundtable, Larry Walker and Ferguson Jenkins. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Have a great day, everybody.